All right, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Care Connect Convo with Dr. Manjanath. Dr. Manjanath is a pediatrician here at Kelsey Siebold, and she is also our managing physician for travel medicine here at Kelsey. So she wears multiple hats, so we're super excited to have her uh, join us for this conversation today. We're gonna wait just a few minutes to let everyone sign on. I know sometimes with technology, we have a little bit of a delay with everyone um, getting signed into Zoom. We're also publishing this live on Facebook. So if you have any questions for us, we'll be monitoring our Facebook stream for questions and comments as well as our Zoom stream. So if you are logged in via Zoom, at the bottom of your screen here, there's a little Q&A box. You can click that to type questions if you have any questions for Dr. Manjanath during our conversation. Um, but we're going to go ahead. I think we have quite a few people joining us on both channels now. So we're going to go ahead and just jump right in. So Dr. Manjanath, um, can you tell us a little bit about your practice at Kelsey Seaples and your background as a physician and how long you've been with Kelsey? Okay, first of all, thank you for having me today, um, Lane. Nice to be in this uh, um, virtual platform. And uh, hopefully we will have uh, some um, questions answered for our viewers today. So uh, my name is Suma Manjanath. I am a pediatrician and I'm also uh, certified by the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And I manage the travel medicine clinics here at Kelsey Seabold Clinic. I've been with Kelsey Seabold uh, since 2002, August. So obviously that's about 18 years. So um, yeah, I've had a good um, uh, long run here. Uh, I enjoy working uh, at Kelsey and I see newborn babies at uh, Texas Children's Women's and Clear Lake Hospital. Great. Um, so we know what pediatricians do, but can you tell us a little bit what the travel medicine department does at Kelsey? So travel medicine department uh, is basically to help travelers, um, both domestic, mostly international travelers, to seek guidance on any kind of um, the vaccinations and medications that they would need when they are traveling outside the country. And obviously also make sure they're well equipped with um, all the necessary um, medical information that they need to know to the destination they're traveling to. So the diseases that are there, how to prevent them, all of those um, counseling is provided during their consult for the pre-travel assessment. So it's been um, a part of Kelsey Seabold for many, many years. And uh, we have a whole uh, team of nurses who help me in managing the clinics uh, very smoothly and um, it's very successful. So does the travel medicine department also see pediatric patients or? Yes. Great. Um, yes, we see all ages. And do you have any special um, advice or tips that you would give your patients? especially your parents of pediatric patients who would be traveling with young kids? So I think, of course, we have to keep the current situation in mind uh, during this pandemic. Um, it is extremely important to keep um, multiple questions in our mind before we decide, is it uh, something that we still need to do? One, is it a requirement um, for this um, or travel, whether it is the sake of um, uh, visiting a sick relative that needs to be seen or uh, work or obviously um, any, any impending uh, family situation that would require the travel. And of course, if it is just for leisure, which a lot of uh, summertime is when most families travel for leisure, then I think we need to weigh the pros and cons. Is this the right time to uh, travel and in that case, how are we going to uh, manage the whole travel from point A to point B? And um, in that case, what are the risks we are in willing to take? And is that 
um, something that we can afford to take. So those are the questions that as a family, each family will have to decide. And if they are actually visiting any other family members, what is their uh, risk for contracting the disease? And will we be possibly taking the disease over there? And in that case, are they healthy? Are they sick? Are they okay with this? All of those kind of nitty-gritties will have to be uh, thought through before taking um, the decision. Are there any travel restrictions that you would suggest patients um, or anyone traveling during the summer to look for? So currently, of course, every country um, is slowly opening up across the world and um, F CDC and the travel uh, networks have a very good uh, information on each country when they are opening up the, the travel skies and also the guidelines for each country is very variable. Every country, of course, have their sovereign right to decide how they will manage the incoming travelers. So it is absolutely important to look into that before making the travel. And also, it might be a good idea to think about um, having a travel insurance in case you did contract the disease and in the case of getting very sick with the disease, how would you be treated and will that be covered and will you need travel insurance? All of those need to be uh, thought through before uh, embarking on an international trip. Um, cruise travel is still not recommended by the CDC or us just for the increased risk of contracting the disease uh, in that situation. And domestic travel, of course, um, again, most states, um, they have different uh, time frames of how they are opening up in phases. Um, it's very important to look at which state parks, which national parks uh, are open if people are planning to go outdoors like um, hike and camp kind of activities because some of them are still not open. So it's actually very important to take a look at what's open, what's not, are the water parks in certain places open, are the theme parks open, what are the restrictions, um, what are the requirements, all of those need to be factored in before taking um, that step to travel. Um, so if you decide you would like to, let's say, take a day trip to visit a family member or um, you know, a, a cousin you haven't seen in a while, are there any special precautions you should take or questions you should ask people you're going to be visiting before you um, decide to make that trip? Yeah, I think the personal health is important. So if um, let's assume I'm a very healthy person with no health issues and I want to visit my cousin who lives a few miles up north and want to go visit them, then of course you also want to factor in the cousin's um, risk factors, health um predisposition and all that. And if the cousin is a very healthy young person and you just want to meet, um, I think the safe distance practicing should still be practiced. Staying six feet away, wearing masks definitely helps so that the droplets are not going from uh, me to the cousin and vice versa. So both people wearing the mask is certainly very helpful. And of course, being very conscientious of not touching the face, washing hands very often, um, and pretty much um, making sure that, you know, you stay in touch with the person just so that it, after you've met them and left, if they are sick, then you do want to know what the outcome is and all that. So, so those are some of the common things to keep in mind before visiting someone. Um, so in the news lately, we've been seeing lots of headlines about swimming. It's hot, it's getting especially warmer here in Texas. Everyone yeah. wants to cool down. Um, is it safe to go swimming? Um, and what are some precautions you can take when you are swimming to avoid, um, you know, coming in contact with someone who may have COVID? Right. Um, so I think the safe distance practices still need to be maintained. That is the most important thing. Uh, if it is not your family unit and if it is people you are um, not in uh, contact with, then you have to maintain the safe distance practicing of the six feet 
apart. Now, back to the poll. At this time, we know for a fact that children shed the virus in the, if they were infected and exposed. They can shed the virus in their stools or feces for a number of days. And depending on the person, sometimes just a few days to many, many days. Now, is that something that is contagious to another person is something we do not know. And also in what extent they need to shed for the other person to get sick from contracting it through the water contamination of the stools is something we do not know at this time. But keeping that in mind, I think most of the pools are taking some personal responsibility of making sure there is high chlorine content, which does a good job of disinfecting anyway of all the other bacteria and viruses we typically see that are waterborne. So I feel like more than the water, it is the people who need to be more careful from other people. So um, that is the critical thing. When there's too many people in the pool, too close to each other, yes, certainly we are more susceptible to contracting the disease through that from all the being happy and screaming and yelling, the droplets go farther. So that's how you can actually pass it to other people than actually from the water itself. So uh, also in the news, we've been seeing a lot of news outlets report that people are feeling more safe or more comfortable doing outdoor things like you mentioned, like hiking. Um, would you consider um, camping or going to a beach house where you can control your environment to be a safe outlet for a vacation for a family who wants to get away? So I think as long as you're aware of packing your own cleaning supplies and making sure for a beach house, for example, if it is not uh, your own property and you're renting uh, this property, then you just need to be equipped with the right amount of hand sanitizer that has over 60% alcohol, cleaning supplies, making sure you cleaned all the high touch surfaces and uh, cooking surfaces thoroughly before you um, occupy the house. And if it is just gonna be your family, I think possibly okay. But um, camping, in, if you're having to use public facilities, whether it is restroom and shower facilities or kitchen facilities, that is a common place for where many other people will also be using, then you, again, you have to go back to the weighing the pros and the cons and the risks and the benefits and decide, is that something that we as a family, are we okay? Or are we more likely to take some disease back home and give it to an elderly or an immunocompromised person who, are, who is living with us? So, so those are some things that people have to factor in. And so I'm glad that you mentioned packing your own cleaning supplies. That's a great tip for families who may be renting a property. Are there any other necessities, especially during um, the pandemic, that you should be packing with you or anything that would be maybe just a good idea to bring along with you on a road trip? I think the main thing is, of course, if uh, there is any long-term medications that we take, it would be a good idea to make sure we take it with us. But um, in general, any simple, um, you know, like I, I'm, I got a headache and I want to take some Tylenol or a bug bit me while I was out there and uh, I'll need some Benadryl. Um, so those are some of the common things that would be a good idea to take with you, especially because uh, of the same reason you don't know if the, all the pharmacies are open or are they open all the time? Are they closing earlier? So various factors. Is the medicine in stock? We don't know. So it's better to go stocked up with our own uh, simple things, first aid kit, Benadryl, uh, Tylenol, those kind of simple things to take with us. And um, I think the other thing to keep in mind is um, also if you do get sick along the way. Is there healthcare facilities around? Are they able to care for us? Um, where, how far would it be? All of those things need to be factored in um, before even we leave the house so we know exactly where we'll be seeking care in case it is necessary. Um, so in terms of traveling internationally, we know that a lot of people are hesitant about it. If we get the all clear to travel internationally, are there any immunizations or vaccines um, that you should get through the travel medicine department before you head out on that trip? 
I would encourage all our uh, viewers to um, take advantage of the pre-travel consult because depending on your destination, uh, the requirements are different, um, the recommendations will be different, and based on your health, uh, pre-existing health issues, again, um, certain medications are okay to take and not. So all of those things will be counseled to the person before their um, departure. So it is extremely a good idea to take advantage of the pre-travel consultation and meet with one of our nurses and um, take care of all the necessary vaccines. And it's a good idea to make the appointment at least one month before the date of departure, because certain vaccines have to be given much before the date of departure. And too often we see people seeking the care just very close to departure time, and it's not enough time to take care of the series of vaccines. Um, they need before their departure, like Japanese encephalitis or uh, rabies. And um, so there's there's many of those kind of vaccines that need to have the minimum requirement of uh, certain days before departure. So that's uh, something to keep in mind. So seek care at least a month before departure. And do we need any immunizations for domestic travel or is it mainly related to international travel? mainly to international travel. At this time, we, don't, we do not need any uh, different vaccines within the country, as long as we are uh, up to date based on the recommendations put out by the immunization practices. So we know we've talked a little bit about looking, and looking for and identifying healthcare that's available in the area that you may be traveling to. Um, but what should, a, you know, a parent or a family member do if someone they're traveling with starts showing signs and symptoms of COVID-19? So I think the important thing is, one, um, if they are symptoms of um, the novel coronavirus, then it's best to quarantine the person in the confines of wherever they are staying um, so that we do not expose that person to multiple other people and then they are all susceptible now to the illness. So try, the, uh, try their best to keep them quarantined. And if there is a facility of their own uh, room and a bathroom, if that is possible, then limit their movement to that area and make sure they are taken care of with lots of fluids, fever management, and we can always consult um, with if they are patients of KLCC board, we have the virtual health and they can always seek care with one of our providers, their primary care doctor through a video visit uh, or a telehealth visit so that they can talk to the doctor and decide if this is something that they can manage wherever they are, shelter in place, or they'll have to either decide to change their travel plans or go to a local ER. So all of those can be managed by their local P uh, primary care doctor at Kelsey Seaboard through the video health uh, visit. So I would encourage all our um, patients to utilize that service that we are providing. And, um, if you have a child with you, can you do a pediatric video visit as well, or is it just yes. limited to adults? No, we are doing pediatric video visits too, and every day we have uh, video visits for various reasons, and so it's absolutely a good idea to take advantage of it. So also it keeps the child in their comfort zone, so it makes a big difference for a sick child not to have to be moved around too much and limit the exposure of the disease to other people. Um, so do you have any other tips or advice for people who may be considering booking summer travel in the next few months? I think the main thing is um, this pandemic is um, here. To, the virus is here to stay. The virus is going to decide the trajectory it will take. So in the next few weeks, as majority of the states across the country open up, we will start seeing the trend, how the disease behaves. Are we gonna see a resurgence and a worse second wave where we see more page, uh, people getting sick due to the illness? Or can we all uh, mitigate this by keeping the mask all the time, maintaining the safe distances, avoiding crowded places as much as possible, all of those kind of uh, things that people have been um, told all these days. So if we can do that, 
hopefully we'll have a better understanding of if we can actually mitigate that second wave being not so severe and we will know more. So I think every country has their sovereign right, like I said, to change plans. So for international travelers, really it is important that they need to be aware that they might not be able to return to United States based on um, the country's plans. They may have to be ready to be tested at the landing or the departure times because there are recommendations by some countries who are doing that. They should be prepared for quarantining in a facility that is provided to them by the either the United States or any other country government for that matter. So they will have to make multiple uh, logical plans to um, mitigate all of these. They have enough time off? Can they work distantly? Can they um, afford to be able to stay in a quarantine facility until it is sorted out? All of that has to be thought through before making the decision. I think that is a very individual decision, but it has to be taken by each person on a case-by-case -case basis. There is no one-size-fits-all. But it's going to be here to stay, and this uh, change in air travel, everything is going to be uh, something that we'll get used to, wearing masks throughout the journey of the airplane. Um, there will be bathroom restrictions. Each airline has their own restrictions on how they're imposing it. They are doing their best to clean the aircrafts, but we may have to take our own cleaning wipes and uh, hand sanitizers and um, masks and all of that uh, to with us to make sure that we are sitting in um, you know, place where we are feeling like we have done enough sanitation. And in an air travel, I think in a way, window seat may be better than I, because not many people are walking around you. So something to consider, if possible, take a window seat. Um, so yeah, those are all some considerations to keep in mind. And you mentioned we're going to constantly have updates as, um, you know, countries open and states open. What is the best source of information to find updates on COVID-19 and other diseases related to travel? CDC Travelers Health, um, cdc.gov um, slash Travelers Health has all the details. You There is a map of the world with all the countries and it's a very interactive map. Uh, it gives you all the things you need to be aware of preventable diseases, in which case you either get medication or vaccine versus non-preventable diseases. For example, Zika, the only way you can prevent it is by using mosquito repellent, but there is no vaccine or medication. So all of those kind of um, information is available on the website in cdc.gov slash travelers health. Awesome. Well, we have a few questions that have come in. So we're going to go ahead and quickly touch base on those since we only have a few minutes left with you before you have to get back to your patients this afternoon. Um, so one question came in regarding swimming again. And should you have kids wear a mask outside of the water if they are um, just sitting around the pool and not in the water? I agree. I think yes. If they are just sitting around uh, without getting in the water, it's a good idea to wear the mask, but of course not recommended when they're in the water. So, um, And then another question that came in was about traveling domestically on road trips. Do you have any suggestions for navigating the um, travel jams that are sort of on the interstate? Um, I think with their what they're asking is, it seems to be there's a long line trying to get into Florida right now um, because they're doing border checks. So do you have any tips for finding information about when the um, travel restrictions would be opened for domestic travel versus international travel? So again, every state in the United States um, has their own guidelines. Like I said, they have their own guidelines on phase reopening. Any state department of health, for example, in this case, Florida Department of Health um, website uh, should be able to give information 
on uh, what their reopening guidelines are and what are their restrictions and what do they expect at the check site and all of those kind of details would be available in the Department of Health um, website of that particular state. Um, and actually through the CDC, um, website, if you go through the coronavirus um, uh, website information, there is a link that through the for the 50 states in the United States, if you click on that particular state link, it'll take you to that particular state and give all the um, sub uh, links for whatever the question may be. Great. Um, well, I think those are the only two questions we had that came in this afternoon. So thank you again for taking time out of your day to join us. And all of you who tuned in via Facebook and Zoom, thank you for joining us for this week's Care Connect Combo as well. Um, we will have other conversations that will keep going through the future. So definitely tune in every week to see what topics we have coming up next. And if you have any questions about um, COVID-19 or the novel coronavirus, you can definitely find that information on Kelsey Siebold's website as well at kelsey-siebold.com. So thank you again, everyone, and Dr. Manjanath for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much for having me and you have a great afternoon too. Bye.